Hello, my name is, is Lauren Taylor from Mount Sinai Hospital, the Samuel Lunefeld Research Institute, and I'm here to talk to you today about some of the mass spec applications we, we've been doing recently for uh, biological research in general and network medicine applications in particular. Uh, I'm just the mouthpiece for this, so I, I've got underlined on this uh, first slide J.P. Lambert, Yang Zheng, and Jan Heng, who are responsible for the three stories I'm going to tell you. Um, they're in the laboratories of Stephen Lai, and Claude Gingra and Tony Pawson at Mount Sinai, respectively. In the past, we've really concentrated on the identification of proteins, and, and, and indeed proteomics has, has surrounded itself with identification for the better part of a decade. And though incredibly powerful, to be useful, proteomics requires you to not only re know what the protein is, but how much is there, especially if you're comparing, say, a cancer cell to a non-cancer cell. So modern biomedical research requires more than just a simple identification of proteins. So actually the present and the future is going to be in quantitative biology uh, uh, as is stated here over the last five years for our users anyway we've uh, well they've asked us to do a lot more quantification and so uh, given the products now coming out of AB Sciex, including their wonderful new Q-traps and triple top systems we've we've got a variety of quantitative workflows working uh, including the traditional MRM workflow, which of course has been used for years for small molecule drugs, we're using it for peptides and proteins. And a lot of it, uh, um, the newer methods like SWATH uh, are terrifically powerful for being able to rough out a quantification of hundreds of proteins at one time. So I'd like to tell you two or three stories about how we're using this equipment and what we're using it for. First story is going to be on cancer and how mutations in, in proteins can help to cause cancer or certainly they don't help to stop it if it naturally occurs in your body. So this comes from Anne-Claude Gingras' laboratory. And what she's done is uh, she's taken a lot of genetic information about, well, cancers. And there's been a lot of sequencing being done on cancer mutations, or at least mutations associated with cancer. And what Anne-Claude's laboratory is really interested, and what JP has done here, is to, well, let's find out how, how these mutations actually manifest themselves in the real world. If we think about the Human Genome Project, I'm pretty sure none of you were asked for any samples. I certainly wasn't. So they didn't sequence all human beings. They sequenced a few. And so uh, in doing, going over that human genome and looking for differences in the mutations, there have been thousands and thousands and thousands of mutations that have been sequenced using genetic technology. So are all these mutations harmful? Probably not. Well, it'd be nice to be able to find out which ones were harmful, which ones weren't. So if we, we, we want to look at the actual mechanism of cancer. We should look at what proteins are being involved with these mutations. Because the proteins are the actually effector molecules. The DNA is more like a library that causes the proteins to be built. So if the library has an issue, a mutation, and it causes a mutant protein to be made, what happens? You know, there's a lot of these mutations. Are they harmless? Or do they cause cancer? So we're going to be using, uh, as a metaphor, a fishing hook uh, to kind of explain the workflow we've got going for this, uh, for this particular story. So we have kinases. Kinases are in your body, they're in my body, and they, they do a very important job. They phosphorylate proteins. So this, this phosphorylation is a switch that's involved in normal life and in, in, in making cells die off gracefully when they're supposed to and creating new cells. And all this is terrifically important as long as it's under tight regulation and control. So kinases have always been important as drug targets. So this is a very, a very simple story. We're going to take a kinase, and we're going to take a kinase that's been mutated, and the mutation's been found in people, and it's been associated with cancer, but no direct cause has been found. So the reason we're using kinases here is they're essential for life, and the mutated forms are associated with cancer. And, um, but instead of using genetic information, we're going to use a proteomic screen with SWATH. And SWATH, of course, is a, a non-assumptive way to gather all of the... Uh, quantitation levels of all of your proteins in a single experiment, and then it allows you the luxury of going backwards in time after you've measured it to tease out any proteins you're interested in. So the way we work this is we do normal identification first, re-inject the sample, and do swath second. So this particular kinase is now going to be contrasted with a mutant or a couple of mutant forms of it and see if there's any differences in the proteins that bind to it because proteins need other proteins to form molecular assemblies to do their work. Here we're looking at a swath readout using marker view. In the upper left-hand corner, circled in blue, 
are what are called biological repeats. Because nature is subtle, we like to see things more than once to be sure that we're, we're seeing something that's real. And this is three biological repeats of the wild type or normal kinase. And the arrow that's pointing over to the other side is the swath plot that shows you the proteins that are associated only with the normal or wild type kinase. And it turns out these are exactly the proteins that should be binding to the wild type kinase. They're inhibitors. And, and what they do is they hang around that kinase and they make sure it only does its job when and where it's supposed to. But it appears with the mutant, if we look on the other side of that triangle on the right-hand side, those red and blue dots, it looks like something else is going on. So let's zoom into this. And if we do zoom into it, we'll see our mutant kinases that are now circled in pink. They seem to associate with a whole other set of proteins. And importantly, they do not associate with the normal set of proteins, with their normal inhibition. So what are they? Let's find out. Because if this uh, mutation causes this kinase to stop interacting with its normal proteins, that's loss of function. And that can be very bad. But what looks to be happening here is it's also picking up other partners it shouldn't. And this might be called gain of function. So perhaps this is the direct link to the cancer. It turns out that this mutant form, both mutant forms of this kinase, are associating very strongly with heat shock 90, which is certainly a cancer-associated protein. And it also associates extremely strongly and very specifically with it. So this could be a, a mechanistic look at why this particular mutation on this particular kinase could cause cancer. Because heat shocks, well, they've been around, we've known about them for a long time. And back, you know, 10 or, 10 or 12 years ago, we've identified them as a, uh, you know, probably involved in cancer. And now we're getting more and more sure they're involved in cancers. And as of a couple of years ago, there's actually 20 inhibitors of this protein in clinical trials to try and stop cancers. So we've taken SWATH and we've used it as a nice way to look very non-assumptively for what's happening with with a kinase that, that's implicated in cancer. And with this SWATH readout, we can now uh, ascertain that mutant kinases, uh, in particular this one, actually lost its ability to bind the proteins it should, and it picked up a partner called heat shock 90. It also showed us that there's another 20 proteins besides heat shock 90 that it look like they're specifically binding to the mutant form of the kinase. So this gives biologists and clinical oncologists and people involved in making pills, a much better picture of, of the mechanistic action of what the mutation does. So instead of just having a genetic idea, these cancers are associated with that gene mutation, you now might have a mechanistic cause. So that's the first story. Second story involves using protein signatures as drug discovery tools. I'd mentioned MRM at the top. Um, MRM is a traditional technique, and AB Cyx has been involved in it for, for a very long time. Indeed, their triple quadrupoles have been the dominant design in the marketplace to cause clinical trials to speed up by using, uh, well, triple quadrupoles to do MRM on small molecules and look at the bioavailability and just basically phase three clinical trial of measuring the amount of drug and drug metabolite left in, in plasma when a patient takes it. We're going to do something a little different. We're going to be quantifying proteins, and these proteins are going to come from protein complexes. And the idea here is that, well, using a blood, uh, if, we, if we just want to do proteomics on blood to look at cancer, blood is extremely complex. And there are so many signals that may be very difficult to try and tease out what's different between a normal cell and a cancer cell. So what we're going to do here is a, a molecular biology um, method uh, 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 similar to what you saw in the first talk with kinases, where we're going to haul down a protein. In this case, it's not a kinase. It's what's called a scaffold or adapter protein. And this particular one's called SHIC1. And SHIC1 is a very important protein in your body. And what we're going to do with it is we're going to pull down SHIC1. And SHIC1, as you're going to see in a second, has a lot of other proteins that bind to it. And we're going to assay this with MRM, traditional MRM, uh, scheduled, time-scheduled MRM. And then, because we're measuring so many signals, not just a single drug, but we're measuring many, many peptides at many, many proteins, we've tried very carefully to try and figure out what is the best way to reproduce or represent these data so that it makes sense to people who don't want to get into the incredible amount of information that such an assay actually gives you. So a little bit more about SHIC. On the left-hand side, you're going to see a, a, a fishing hook into a funny looking thing. These, these are domains of SHIC, uh, PTB domain and, and SH2. We don't have to worry about this level of detail for right now. 
But if we go to the middle of the picture, the upper portion is supposed to represent a cell membrane. And outside your cells, you have receptors. And these receptors sense things like sugars or growth factors or drugs or a variety of things to try and sell, tell the inside of the cell what's going on. And sometimes the outside of the cell will get a very specific signal. In this case, we have a receptor for epidermal growth factor, you know, things that grow skin. And we have a factor called epidermal growth factor that fits into an epiderm epidermal growth factor receptor. And when that happens, then a signal transduces through that membrane and it starts to interact with Schick. And then Schick starts to very specifically interact with other sets of proteins over time. So over the years, we built up an MRM assay for all things Schick, all things that bind to Schick. And the reason we've done this is this gives us a really nice indication of the signaling that's going inside a cell. So instead of pulling down the receptor, we would do that if we could, but there are technical reasons why pulling a receptor down are not easy. So what, right underneath the receptor are scaffold proteins like Schick. And it sort of takes the signal from the receptor and transduces it to other more effective proteins. So uh, my boss, Tony Possum, this, is, this work comes from his lab, has, has reckoned that if we could use something like Schick as a, a bait, and we can pull down all the proteins involved with Schick at any particular time from any cell, you know, after we treated it with a drug or not, or a growth factor or not, and then just measure the responses of how these proteins come and, and go from the Schick complex, that we might be able to tease out some mechanism of action. And it turns out this works very well. So just to show you a little bit more of the workflow for traditional MRM here, it's time scheduling MRM. We have a cell lines, um, and, and, or, or it could be a tumor, but in this case, a cell line. So we're going to take it, we're going to add a growth factor to the cells. But then we're going to take our fishing hook, reach inside the cells, we burst them open, and then we grab out Schick and all of its partners. And then we do traditional um, sample preparation for proteomics, which involves cutting up the proteins with trypsin. We run them into, uh, to, in, into a 5600, which does a marvelous identification for us. So we take those identification of, uh, uh, data, and then we, make, we pull out what are called proteotypic peptides, or the best responding peptides for each protein we're interested in, and for each um, site of modification, whether it be phosphorylation or something like that. And then we program it into a formal scheduled MRM assay. So this assay takes a while to create because it is a very particular thing and you have to be careful that there's not other peptides that are interfering with you. You need to make sure that you've got good enough sensitivity and after you've done method validation, then you have a, a very powerful uh, method that can be used over and over and over and over and over and over again. And that's what we're doing. So, after pulling down Schick, after uh, stimulating a cell or, or, or uh, with a drug or a growth factor or whatever you like, you can look at the differences. So normally what we do, if I want to show you the difference of one protein, so we have Schick, and this particular panel, what we're looking for is Schick associating itself with the receptor itself. So on the left-hand panel, where it says unstim, this is before we add any EGF to stimulate Schick to go to the receptor, you'll see some signals that are, that are pretty low. In the middle panel, after I've added EGF, you can see the signals are higher. And then the panel next to it is actually another, is a, is a drug. And you can see the amount of EGF stuck to Schick is somewhere in between the left-hand one where there's very little and, some, and where there's quite a bit in the middle. So, this is what traditional MRM of peptides looks like. Every one of those signals is actually a summation of three what are called transitions. So there's multiple data being piled up here for evidence. This isn't one measurement. It's more like uh, one, two, eight or nine or 10 or 11 peptides times three transitions. So 33 or 40 measurements just for that one protein. Now that's great for certainty. We know for a fact that that is the protein we're looking at, and we know for a fact that that is the amount of it. But it gets very unwieldy if you try and plot out many, many proteins. So what we've done is we've, we've reduced all that data down to a dot plot. And so you sum those multiple signals and you create a dot plot. So it, even though we have an enormous amount of information, all we've done now is reduced it to, yes, the protein is there, and how much. And from that, now, we can create all sorts of, of large arrays of patterns that, that people who don't really care about the nuts and bolts of the mass spectrometry can start to understand. Because when you have a relative amount of a protein, or an absolute amount, from a cell line, compared to one condition to another, 
biologists can really start to construct theories of what's going on here. This reads like a book to them. And, and from the relative amounts, you can try and tease out mechanisms of cancer. You can tease out a, a, a variety of things. Here, here, for example, is a dot plot of a normal wild-type chick. And uh, on the left-hand side, as you go down, these are all the proteins that stick to chick. And then we've done a little bit of a time course. So, um, and it doesn't matter whether you do a time course or not. But in this instance, we've, we've added um, EGF to the cells at zero minutes. We pulled out chick and its complex. That's the first row, column rather. And then you'll see at the bottom, three minutes, 15 minutes, and 45 minutes. So this is how the cell is changing over time. Each one of those rows is an individual protein. So again, we get a very nice pattern of what normal chick looks like. But what would happen if this particular instance, chick itself is mutated, so that part of what it binds to stopped binding to other proteins? So here is a schematic of that. You can see the middle pane. We've knocked out part of the chick complex. So the middle group of proteins is no longer associated with chick. And furthermore, we can do another mutation of chick and show that we can knock out a whole other set of proteins. And this, again, as with the kinase story, shows us that we can assay for terrifically large amounts of information about mechanistic effector molecules in a cancer mo uh, state and try and tease out what's actually happening. So these sorts of assays are of terrific importance to drug makers because they can, well, they can try all sorts of things on cancer cells and then look at not just if the cell dies or doesn't die or gets big or small, or, or, or they can look at the underlying molecular information from a mechanistic sense. Now, one of the issues with this is it took us years to make this MRM assay. Um, very exacting. Our technologists are superb at what they do. And it requires a lot of babysitting, if I may use that right word. So it would be better if we found a better way than just identifying proteins to start creating an MRM assay. And of course, the obvious way to do that is with swath, because swath is not assumptive and easy. And by easy, I mean it's a single type of experiment. If you're measuring a Schick pull down or, or a kinase pull down, or as we'll see in a second, so, so, some white blood cell stuff, it's the same exact experiment. It's a commodity, in other words. You can do it again and again and again without any programming. So here is a swath readout from a couple of types of cancer cells. And these have been stimulated with, with EGF also, and a couple of another growth factor. So what we have here, it looks a little bit messy, so I'll, I'll see if I can take you through it. Let's take the top two panels. This, this is one type of uh, cancer cell. And we've got, similar to what we showed with the kinases, we've got regions on one side that's associated with unstimulated growth factor one and growth factor two. The one, um, circles with the same colors, the corresponding plot to the right, show you the proteins that are associated with each growth factor or with each unstimulated cell. And so it turns out each type of cancer cell has got its own pattern. And after you perturb that cancer cell with a drug or with a growth factor or, or, or nothing at all, you can read out everything that's sticking to Schick. So it turns out that cancer cells, well, they have Schick sticking to EGFR whether there's any signal there or not because the cancer cell wants to keep firing. It keeps going and it can't stop itself. That's part of the problems with cancer. So even without perturbing a cancer cell with this sort of swath analysis, we can say, hey, it's cancerous right from the get-go. We can also use this sort of simple swath plot to help the drug researchers and clinicians to try and perturb the cancers and look at how things are affected. So it's a great starting point later if you want to change the amount of pro different types of proteins you want to put in your MRM assay because the swath workflow gathers in all of the information necessary for a scheduled MRM assay, which is indeed the retention time in the column, which peptides you want to quantify, and the transitions. So if we had SWATH five or six years ago when we started the Schick story, we probably would have had a much easier time in generating the MRM assays. Next story. This is more of public health. And Stephen Lai's laboratory is very interested in threatened preterm labor. And threatened preterm labor is a problem everywhere in the world. What it is, is women coming in and presenting, they're in labor. They know it. It certainly looks like it's not Braxton Hicks contractions, it's contractions. And it looks like babies coming. So that happens 2 million times a year in the U.S. Uh, but of those 2 million women that came in, only 100,000 really give birth. And, and so it's not only a high amount of cost involved in, in hospitalizing women who should be at home, 
Um, there's also um, potential health risks to mom and health risks to baby because what happens is she has threatened preterm labor. If she's not in a, in a major center, she may have to go into a, a you know transfer to a level three hospital like Mount Sinai. Um, you have separation from family, the cost of the of the helicopter maybe. When she gets in, the first thing they're going to do is assume she's in real labor, and they're going to try and give baby a chance to start breathing if he's coming out or she's coming out soon. So they they, they actually give mom a lot of steroids, and that steroid has to go in and does a variety of things to, to baby, but it mostly starts its lungs maturing so it can start to breathe. And these steroids work tactically, but there's long-term adverse effects. And then they're going to try and give mom medication to stop her from going into labor. The medication doesn't work very well, but, it, you know, they have, they're have they desperate. They have to try because if she, if, she, if she goes into labor too soon, things are going to be bad for everybody. So these, these tocolytics are given, and, and there's maternal and fetal side effects. So, so it's not just a money issue of the 1.9 million women who should be going home in America um, instead of the 100,000 who are actually going to give birth out of the 2 million. Th there's money involved, but... Most of it is long-term health care effects. So what we're going to do now is we're going to try and use SWATH to look at, well, we need a test, don't we? Because if only 5% of those women are actually admitted, we need a test to separate out true false uh, preterm labor from false. And the false ones, they can go off and have supportive care. No, you're going to be okay. You're not giving birth. Go back home. Things will be fine. Come back in a few weeks when you're supposed to be here. So that's why we're going to create this test. How do we do it? Well, we're going to try and figure out what are the best molecules to measure. So I'd mentioned earlier that blood, blood's tough. Uh, there's many, many things in blood, even in plasma, um, and it might be hard to do that. So there is a whole body of literature that white blood cells might be more useful here. And, and so, and Stephen Lies lab and others have got some very nice work showing that, that the white blood cells actually talk between mom and baby. And that makes some sense. Before mom is going to give birth, uh, baby has to know that, and, and baby has to tell mom what's going on, too. So these white blood cells apparently wander through the placenta, and they share molecular information between mom and baby. So Stephen's uh, um, postdoc, uh, an, an excellent researcher called Jan Heng, she, she's gone through and, and designed a, a swath workflow. And what we've done is we've taken white blood cell guts, lysates, from white blood cells, and we've tried to do swath on them. And the idea is to try and find out a difference because if inside the white blood cells is the mechanistic molecules to say, hey, we're, we need to deliver this baby now, then maybe we can tell the difference between a woman who's about to do that right now and one that's going to be doing it at least a few days later, if not weeks. So we've got um, an easy way to get our samples because blood is already collected from women when they come in the hospital. And the outcome of, of, this, uh, of this is fairly obvious that the child is born or not. And, uh, you know, we've always got some science to progress here. So, so part of this project was to provide improvements to existing probiomics methods by looking at the swath uh, as a biomarker um, experimental design. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the conversion of swath into MRM, because swath is new, it's very comprehensive, but it might make more sense to turn it into an MRM assay if you're going to apply it in a clinic. So let's see how this worked out. We took white blood cells. We, uh, we put it through mass spectrometry through SWATH, did the data reduction, we had a million data points, and the idea was to try and find signals that differentiate between women who are going to give birth and women who don't. So it's a very small clinical trial, very small, and I do not mean we have found biomarkers for threatened preterm labor here. What we have is a really intriguing data set from 40 patients, which are a control group of 24 who went ahead and gave birth normally, but did present with threatened preterm labor, and the threatened preterm labor group who actually delivered prematurely. And it turns out, using very similar um, mathematics as we, as we showed you before from Markerview, though this is not Markerview, but it is principal components, you can indeed separate out women um, who are going to give birth from women who cannot. Now, we have not um, taken these biomarkers into a clinical trial. This is just suggestive, so I don't mean we found them, but these are really intriguing data. And of course, we can now we can now target these individual proteins that we think are implicated in being markers for threatened preterm labor and turn them into a validated MRM assay. But I think before we do that, we're going to go ahead and try and tease out more information. Because, as I mentioned with SWATH, you can go backwards in time. After you've measured your data, you can, you can go back and reanalyze again and again and again. So, it turned out that this group could have been split into three. 
And those three would be the women who didn't give birth until their pro the time was proper, so very many weeks or months after they presented in the hospital. The women who gave birth, and then there was a middle group who gave, who gave uh, birth about two days later or three days later. And it turns out you can separate these out too. There are, there are markers that are indicative of preterm labor, not preterm labor, and sort of midterm labor. So all these are now candidates for formal assays that we can take back, go back into the clinic, take new samples from women and try and assay them. And then if we are fortunate enough that we can burrow into a mechanistic molecule or protein or group of proteins, then we'll have a bona fide biomarker test that'll be very useful to save a lot of money and more importantly, uh, improve public health. So that's the three stories I wanted to talk about. Uh, again, I'm just the mouthpiece for this. This was done at, at Mount Sinai, at Samuel Lunafeld Research Institutes in the laboratories of, uh, of Jingra and, and Pawson and Y. Um, and I'd like to thank a whole bunch of people who are on the title page. So if you care to go back, you, you'll find all those marvelous biologists. We had uh, some help uh, from Dana Farber for the, the Kinase Mutant Project and from Craig Pennell who collected the, the samples in Western Australia for threatened preterm labor. And I'd really like to thank um, our our wonderful compatriots up at AB SciX who've been who've been very instrumental in, in not only uh, letting us get uh, access to technology, but talking us through it and helping to improve the software. So thank you very much.